All right, this is The Earth and Its Peoples by Richard Bullitt. Chapter 33, New Challenges in a New Millennium. Section one, Globalization and Economic Crisis. So this is the last chapter of The Earth and Its Peoples book. Uh, one thing to take note of when studying world history is that typically the very last chapter and the most recent events tend to tend to have the most variation depending on what book you're using or uh, you know where you're learning history at and that's because the events are so recent that we really don't have enough perspective to accurately assess their historical importance so even in this text the earth and its peoples depending on what edition of the book that you have uh, there's going to be a lot more variation in the types of topics that are covered uh, depending on when that book was published. So that's just something to keep in mind where there seems to have been a trend back in 2013, for example. Two years later, that trend could have reversed and therefore some of that information comes dated. So do just keep that in mind. One thing, though, that we can say for certain um, about the history of the world following the year 2000 is the increase in globalization. Globalization is the interconnectedness of the world. And especially after the falling of the Soviet Union in 1991, whereas the Soviet Union and the Eastern Bloc nations in Eastern Europe were really cut off from outside contact in a lot of ways, at, le at least economically speaking, uh, many of those nations have now become more integrated in the world. The same thing is true of the former Soviet states like Russia and even a country like China, which remains communist in name, but at least economically speaking, is uh, trading and engaging with the rest of the world. So the world has certainly become more connected uh, in this, again, new millennium, meaning after the year 2000. Uh, interconnectedness can be simply communication. A lot of this has to do with technological advancements like the internet. It could also just mean with things like trade. Some good examples of this, of how our economy is even more interconnected today than it was uh, even just you know, 20, 30, 40 years ago. Uh, oil is a commodity that is being increasingly used by those developing nations, China and India, two of the most populated countries in the world today are increasing oil consumption. And whereas in the 1970s, organizations like OPEC, we'll say 1970s, had a monopoly on oil, uh, because of the energy crisis, you have new producers in places like the United States. Russia produces a lot of oil these days. Um, and so oil is becoming increasingly a, a global commodity, even in places that are now joining the industrial nations like you know, Western Europe and the United States. Increasingly, there are organizations that are created to foster more trade and more connection. One great example of this is the formation of the European Union which is a union to promote trade and travel in Europe. Uh, so for example, the euro, which is a currency, is what we might call, we'll call it well, a currency that is uniform. In Europe. So for example, rather than every single individual country having to do some sort of currency exchange where you spend one sort of currency in Spain, one in uh, Portugal, one in France, one in Germany, uh, generally speaking, no matter where you are, the euro uh, as a currency can be used. And you can see how this could foster more economic integration. However, there have been some questions about this sort of interconnectedness and how it creates a certain vulnerability. It's also true that some nations are net, um, you know, that they add uh, 
to these sort of economic agreements, and there are others that tend to be more of a hindrance. So for example, in the European Union, the case of Greece and Germany, uh, Greece in general tends to cost the European Union more, whereas Germany as an economy, which is more stronger, uh, tends to uh, add value to the European Union. And this has, this has caused some nations to maybe reconsider the usefulness of such, uh, you know, sort of organizations and agreements. Uh, more recently, this isn't covered in the text, but, you know, Brexit is a great example of, in this case, uh, England wanting to, or, yeah, England uh, or the United Kingdom. Um, the United Kingdom wanting to break away from uh, the European Union. In North America, the NAFTA, not really called the NAFTA, but NAFTA and the North American Free Trade Agreement has made it possible to trade between Mexico, the US, and Canada. And the WTO, or the World Trade Organization, was created to promote free trade. Now, some of this hesitation towards this increasingly connected economy was a result of the global financial crisis, which happened in 2008. This was the worst economic downturn since the Great Depression. It was connected to housing in particular. Uh, the prices of housing leading up to 2008 were increasingly rising uh, and people believing that their homes were valued for much, much, much more than they actually were we're using them as collateral against other things. Banks, investors also use house prices or housing prices as collateral against things like loans, risky investments. There was a lot of speculation. Speculation is the belief home prices would pretty much always rise, right, always rise. And when the housing market crashed, when it turned out, turned out that homes were not as valuable as they once were, this sparked off a global financial crisis, in part due to the interconnectedness of the economy, because economies and banks were linked in a way that really had never been the case before. This affected not just the United States and other countries where housing prices were the most uh, speculated on, uh, but really everywhere, right, all around the world. Major institutions failed. Lehman Brothers, which was a very stable and established bank in the United States, so this was a U.S. bank, failed. Uh, the U.S. President, Barack Obama, U.S. President, uh, we'll say intervened in the financial crisis. One thing that President Barack Obama did was to provide government loans or government, we call it government bailout for the auto industry. So the, or the auto industry bailout was, we'll call it a, um, this was done by Barack Obama. It was a government uh, plan to save U.S. car makers from going bankrupt. And uh, other countries took very similar measures to try and save their economies from this uh, financial crisis. Uh, the result of this, in some ways, has been even more suspicion of having an economy uh, connected around the world. Another trend that we can say, I would say with a little bit less certainty following the collapse of the Soviet Union, has been the growing de uh, trend towards democracy around the world. Uh, while we can say with certainty there has been more free trade and more interconnectedness, uh, 
there is some evidence to suggest that we're becoming a more democratic world in the post 2000. Some good examples include the fall of the Soviet Union. Pretty much every former Soviet and Eastern Bloc nation turned towards democracy. In the case of Russia, this is a little bit less clear. The president, Vladimir Putin, in some ways has rolled back democracy, uh, initially stepping down in 2008, I believe, but then making himself president once again, which was not um, supposed to happen according to the Russian constitution, but Vladimir Putin put himself as president anyways. In Myanmar, Aung San Suu Kyi transformed Myanmar from a military rule into a democracy. In Africa, the trend towards democracy has continued. In South Africa, Nelson Mandela, who represented the African National Congress, was the first post-apartheid president when he stepped down. South Afri Africa remained a democracy. It's always very shaky when a populist leader like Mandela, who had widespread support, uh, whether or not he would step down and allow for a new ruler to take place, or whether he'd pull a Vladimir Putin and keep himself in rule. In Sudan, the Republic of South Sudan, after a you know very violent civil war broke away and retained its independence. So the Republic of South Sudan will say broke away from Sudan. Darfur was the site of a violent uh, civil war. The ruler of Sudan, Omar al-Bashir, ruler of Sudan, Uh, committed genocide against the South Sudanese population. So after a period of violence in the early 2000s, the Republic of South Sudan broke away. And of course, we'd call this a more democratic government here. The people of South Sudan no longer being under the rule of Omar al-Bashar and Sudan in general, but two countries being created. And in the Arab world, the Arab Spring, the Arab Spring was in the 2010s. This was, generally speaking, a group of nations which ousted or at least challenged previous governments in favor of more democratic institutions. So the Arab Spring will call a political uprising in the Arab world that will say trended to Oh, I don't know why that. I'm going to erase that. Uh, political uprising in the Arab world trended to democracy, we'll say. However, there has been some question as to what the long term repercussions of the Arab Spring was. In some nations, it has resulted in democracy, but in others, it has created instability that allowed for um, anti-democratic um, organizations and groups to have more influence. So one example is the Mus Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt, which remains a very powerful force. Another good example is the case of Syria. Uh, the Arab Spring has resulted really in a civil war where Omar uh, Omar al-Assad -Bas -Assad, uh, continues to try and maintain control of Syria there. But generally speaking, again, post-2000s, we could probably say on a whole that the globe is becoming more democratic. Two areas in which democracy really struggled to take root, Iraq and Afghanistan, both of these having in common that the United States prompted regime change and the catalyst for US regime change in Iraq and Afghanistan in a lot of ways 
mostly Afghanistan, but we'll get to Iraq in, this, in a second, was the 9-11 or September 11th terrorist attacks. These ter terrorist attacks were orchestrated by Osama bin Laden. He is what we might call a fundamentalist uh, Muslim who uh, we'll say resented U.S. influence in the Muslim world. He is the leader and founder of the organization Al-Qaeda, which is an international terrorist organization which is responsible for carrying out the September 11th attacks. The attacks included members of Al-Qaeda hijacking commercial airplanes and crashing them into the United States, namely the World Trade Center, which was the kind of the represent, representation of the United States economy, and the Pentagon, which is the US military which resulted in the deaths of 2,600 Americans. This was the deadliest attack against the United States since Pearl Harbor. And in the aftermath, the United States declared the global war on terror. This was a result of President George Bush, George W. Bush. And the global war on terror was a response to the September 11th attacks. It was to oust any regime that was friendly to people like Osama bin Laden or friendly to organizations like Al-Qaeda. One of those regimes was the Taliban. This was the, Af we might say, Afghan Afghan regime uh, friendly to Al-Qaeda. and it was ousted by the US in 2001. So the United States invaded Afghanistan because the Taliban government harbored Al-Qaeda and uh, then began a, a very long process of trying to create a new and rebuild a, a different government in Afghanistan, which has proved to be a very difficult task. The September 11th attacks really changed in some ways the trajectory of the United States. Because of those attacks, the United States took a much more aggressive approach in battling the global war on terror, including the policy of preemptive attack, meaning that it was no longer acceptable for the United States to sit back and wait for the next attack but to go after regimes that were hostile towards the United States and wanted to do harm. George W. Bush outlined these regimes as the axis of evil, which included Iraq, Iran, and North Korea. Uh, and it was those regimes that were building weapons of mass destruction, a weapon of mass destruction also called WMD, is either a biological, or maybe nuclear or atomic weapon that can do uh, an enormous amount of harm. And the fear was that these nations, Iraq, Iran, and North Korea, trying to develop such weapons and then give it to a, an organization like Al-Qaeda and you know that blowing up or doing an enormous amount of damage in an American city. So the United States made the case that Iraq was making weapons of mass destruction. Not everybody was on board. The United Nations, for example, wanted to do more inspections of the nation, but the United States said that it would go and um, you know, make sure that this wasn't happening by invading Iraq with a coalition of, a will of the willing. Coalition of the willing are the nations uh, allied with the US to attack Iraq in 2003. Uh, the United States and Great Britain were amongst the coalition of the willing. 
Some nations that were not a part of it included France, Russia, and China, which didn't approve of U.S. military action. Saddam Hussein, the dictator of Iraq, was ousted from power and eventually executed for war crimes. And following Saddam Hussein's uh, execution, much like in Afghanistan, the effort to rebuild Iraq as a democracy has proved a you know, difficult and rather bloody task. Whereas the United States did cause regime change in Iraq, it did not in the case of Iran and North Korea, although these nations remain very hostile towards the US. And uh, you know, the United States hostile towards them, certainly back. The invasion of Iraq has become much more controversial than the invasion of Afghanistan, and that was because the claimed WMD or the claimed weapons were not found. Right, not found. However, much of the uh, politics of the Middle East still center around the conflict between Israel and Palestine, which has been a very long and bloody affair. Uh, the post 2000s uh, really aren't any different. Hezbollah and Hamas, these are two what we might call anti-Israeli, uh, we'll call them parties, gained power in Lebanon and Palestine respectively. They were both Iranian supported. Uh, the West Bank and Gaza Strip, these are the territories Uh, in Israel with large Palestinian oops just a big mess Palestinian Let's see I mean large Palestinian populations. I mean, more or less, we could call uh, the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. I mean, we could pretty much just call it Palestine in a lot of ways. And, um, you know, from the post 2000s, it's been a, um, you know, pretty much a story of suicide bombs, of kidnappings, of rocket attacks, and um, with the Israeli Defense Force uh, the, or the Israeli Army conducting things like airstrikes in the Gaza Strip and West Bank invasions. And it continues to be a very contested part of the world even to this day. Uh, the United States allied with Israel, Iran allied with Palestine, and continues to be a source not just between Israel and Palestine, but really international politics. Meanwhile, in Afghanistan, the Taliban still remains a very powerful force, a powerful force in Afghanistan. And, uh, you know, efforts to try and rebuild that country will inevitably, or at least it seems like inevitably, uh, include the Taliban as being a part of that in some way, shape or form.